and I went to get around and I looked and I could see down the line my entire troop. Da 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 da. And just looking at this bunch of warfighters getting after it. And I just gave myself the second to register this because I was like, brother, this is one of those things you are going to remember for the rest of your life. And it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And here's what I loved about it these guys standing shoulder to shoulder, throwing down. It was awesome. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Derek Natalini, who spent decades in the Army with both Ranger Battalion and 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, better known as the unit. This is one of the most interesting interviews we've ever done. Derek deployed countless times, beginning in Afghanistan in 2002, and conducted HBT operations, hostage rescue, including the rescue of Roy Hollams, ran low vis and sniper operations, and eventually volunteered to execute Singleton missions. After leaving the service, Derek went through a painful and long process to manage traumatic brain injury or TBI. Despite those challenges, he would go on to help sell a company, earning what he aptly refers to as his business ranger tab, became a certified life and wellness coach providing pro bono support to veterans, and is now the director of outreach and development at Music Corps. This is a music rehabilitation program that helps wounded warriors play music and recover their lives. Derek is easily one of the most accomplished people we've had on the podcast, and I hope you enjoy this funny, but also very personal experience with the highs and lows of the elite as much as I did. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time to share your story with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's a great show. And so it's an honor for me to be here with you. Thanks for this. Thank you. And I got to start out here by saying that it's people like you that make me feel like I can never write a book about myself because how can you ever stack up against some of the things we're going to talk about? And as people have heard in the intro, um, you've you've done quite a few things, almost Forrest Gump, like I, I have to say, uh, in, on <laughs> reflection. But um, just just before my we friends get into, are never going to let me live that down. I'm no, okay, that. good. Um, just before we jump in, as we were getting ready to hit start on this, you mentioned that you might have something that you refer to as TBI head. I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I think it sets the context. It'll give people a frame of reference as we go through a pretty incredible experience that you have with your time in the service and afterwards. Yeah, sure. Um, we, um, you know, when you and I talked about this session, we, we said that we would make time to get to the TBI issue. And so we can discuss it in greater depth at whatever point yeah. you want. But to answer your question as succinctly as possible, it's it's. 4.07 p.m. here, and um, I I found out that I have brain damage, which we call traumatic brain injury here uh, in the service. Um, I found out in 2016. I ate my last significant charge in 09, and so I went for seven years, longer really, but seven years from my last charge to my diagnosis, not understanding I had brain damage. And there were things, significant things that I did in my career during those seven years. We did. I'm, I'm going to, you know, if I say I, there are as a classified number of really great soldiers who had the same issues. Um, many. So um, when I was fortunate enough, someone cared enough about me to have me go to the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, and we could talk about that whenever. When I got there and they provided me with diagnosis and the pictures of my brain where I could see the damage, one of the things they said was that you're never going to be able to work hard enough to overcome the challenges of having this kind of an injury, which was a significant piece of guidance to, to someone like me because we we hard ranger our way through things. Whether you're a SEAL or a Green Beret or, you know, what you did for a living, there's always that gut check time and they assess for that. That doesn't that doesn't work as often as it normally does. And so at a certain point during the end of the day, and I noticed during the seven year period before I was diagnosed, 
that at the end of the day, I just ran out of gas. And I thought that was me. And it, it still to this day feels shameful. It's hard to be a person who at four, five, six in the evening will sit there with a whole bunch of things to do and stare at the wall and two hours will go by. And I don't know that. So um, yeah. just at this point in time, this stage of, of the day, I'm, I'm working to be the best version of myself I can. Got it. So didn't realize we were putting you up at, at a tough time of day, but just with that, is that a symptom that people, and we'll get to TBI more in general and, and the treatment, but is that a symptom somebody might, like if they're sitting here and they don't know if they have it and they, and they think like, well, that's weird. This happens to me at four or 5 PM in the afternoon. Um, somebody who's been in the service and may have eaten some of the charges as you talked about. I, I, in a word, yes. I, I really have become over the years a fan of, of the phrase cognitive bandwidth and just respecting cognitive bandwidth. And we can have varying levels of cognitive bandwidth for any number of reasons, experience, intelligence. Um, but for those, for those who have been, have suffered some kind of damage, you know, brain damage, that cognitive bandwidth is a limited resource. And if somebody is running out of Schlitz towards, you know, at a certain, with a certain, load imposed on them throughout a day or a week. It is a natural and normal thing um, and not their fault to reach a limit and, and um, need to just take a knee and face out as we used to say in the army. Yeah. I love it. So with that in mind, I want to jump to comfort zones because as you and I were preparing for this there, I, I think I'm just struck by um, as we'll see throughout your career, the way you're kind of pushing yourself out of comfort zones quite frequently, but you actually refer to it um, as you were growing up and help getting there. So if you can kind of take us back to to growing up and what your tolerance was within the comfort zones, um, what did you, how did you handle that? Well, I didn't handle it. I was blessed to have, uh, I was blessed to have a father who handled that you know, on, you know, on my behalf. So, um, you know, if I had reached some kind of a limit, you know, he was there to coach me, you know, as forcefully as necessary through that obstacle, because that was a, so many times just a construct, something, my lack of experience or that place I was in my life, I couldn't possibly know a thing. And so he would step in at that point and coach coached me through that, um, you know, with his own special style. And what are some of the examples of that, where that special <clears throat> style coming out and how it influenced you? Um, you know, he was, he's, my father's a combat veteran. He's a, he's a Vietnam combat veteran. He was an H-34 pilot. And then he went to Air America and supported the covert action program in Laos. So, you know, he's, you know, he lost his father at a very early age. And so when the Marine Corps stepped in, I, I would, um, you know, maybe he would argue this point if, uh, you know, if he were here right now. But he learned, he, he acquired an ethos and a pathos that felt very much like a, a Marine Corps inspired thing. And so we, my brother and I experienced that growing up. And so w one of the things, uh, you know, one of the anecdotes that comes to mind is that, um, I don't know if, if when you were in elementary school, if they still had the presidential physical fitness award. They did. Yeah. And they've got a version of it. Too. I don't know if they call it the same, but my kids go through some of the standardized um, physical events today. Okay. It was either it was a big deal in my elementary school or I made it a big deal in my elementary school in, in years. I don't, I don't recall, but you had to take a PT test for it. And I always was fine with the upper body type stuff because, of course, my father, you know, required that I exercise at least 30 minutes a day in addition to all of the <laughs> patrolling through the woods I did. And um, so the the isometric stuff was no problem. But it turns out I had childhood bronchitis or childhood asthma. I, I can't remember which of the two it was. And when it would flare, it was significant enough sometimes that I would end up in the hospital. And there was one incident where it was really bad and my parents did something they don't normally do which was that they put me in bed with them and I was between the two of them and I was wheezing very badly and and I could hear them talking and there was clearly concern 
And um, sometime after that, um, my father took a notable interest in, in running. I, I took the presidential PT test one year and I failed it on the run. I, I just was gassed. I, I ended up with one of these breathing episodes during the run and I uh, went back pretty ashamed. I really wanted to get, you know, the presidential and, um, and I boloed the run. And, um, around about that time, my father took, took a memorable interest, a strange interest in running. And, um, and I used to have to go with him and my mother to the track, a local track, it was a quarter mile track, and they would run a bit. And then he invited me to run. It was really not an invitation. It was just a polite, initially polite invitation to run. And then it became a requirement because, of course, we, we all know where this is going, which is that I was fortunate to have a father who wanted me to face that problem head on. And I think my recollection of it was that failing the run bothered me on a level that bothered him. And so he took the time to go to the track and then teach me how to run. And I went kicking and screaming uh, to the extent that you can kick and scream as Alex Natalini's child. But certainly my level, the, the level of protesting I could get away with. And he had me run with him and taught me how to pace myself and that sort of thing. And then one day, and I hated it every single time, and I didn't understand what was going on until... He said, okay, now you're going to run by yourself. And I want you to run around this track four times. And I was like, four times? Four times? He's like, that's right, it's a mile. I was like, you want me to run a mile? And, um, and I, I tried to get out of it, and that didn't go very well. I was he t- off. I, you're running. You're go. And I ran, and I thought, cool, I've – got the biggest you know ogre of a father ever you know lucky me and he'd be at a band i'd come around a band hating my life uh and there he was encouraging me in his way um and i just kept going and i was really just propelled by his presence there and the fact that there was no version of this where i was not running around that track four miles four times rather and by the time I came around the, the last bend on the last lap and he encouraged me and I'm looking at the home stretch, which is really kind of where I lost it on that PT test for the presidential. Man, there he was at the finish line on a knee with his arms wide open and I just fell into that man's arms and he picked me up <clears throat> And he told me how proud he was of me. And he had me run my first mile. And brother, I was nine. I was nine. (laughs) So, uh, and then of course, you know, the upshot of it is that when I went and did the presidential PT test that year, I crushed it. But I didn't didn't crush it because of me, really. I, I crushed it because I had... I had somebody who cared enough to push me outside of my comfort zone and show me how to drive hard, you know, towards, towards meeting a meeting mission. So this is really interesting. I'd like to ask, um, just for those who can't see you right now, um, who are just listening behind you on the wall are seven or eight guitars that are hanging there. And I know music is an important part of your life that we'll, we'll touch on because of what you're doing now with AmeriCorps or music Mm -hmm. Corps. sorry, music Corps. Um, can you talk about when music is introduced into your life, if it comes in as a child or later on? Yeah, you know, I was, um, you know, I, I remember initially hearing, you know, hearing um, an Elvis song and like so many people, you know, in decades before who heard him, I was like, because I grew up in a classical music household. There, there were classical music bands and opera. We were not a rock and roll household. Um, and I, I heard Is that odd noise. for the Marine father? I feel like, are a lot of Marines listening to opera? I've stereotyped Man, him. well, he's, yeah, I know, right? He's a naturalized <laughs> citizen. So he actually, he was born in Florence and, and then spent the first half of his life in British oh, boarding wow. school. Oh, yeah, man. So when he showed up in the States in the 50s and rock and roll was coming over, he'd spent this much 
you know, this portion of his life so far, you know, steeped in steeped in the culture of a, an aristocratic northern Italian family and educated in the UK. Wow. OK. So, um, you know, rock and roll was noise, I think, as far as 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 far as they were concerned, compared to the stuff he was used to listening to. I mean, if, if Luciano Pavarotti was doing a concert on PBS, we were watching Pavarotti do his concert on PBS on a Wednesday night. Right. So, but for, for me, the first time I heard rock and roll, it was an Elvis song, I think it was Hound Dog or something like that. And so my mother, I think it was my mother bought me an Elvis record and kind of, you know, kind of slid it over and like, here you go. And, you know, um, but the one that got me, dude, was was um, my very first record I ever bought myself that I went out looking for uh, was the Rolling Stones Still Life album. I heard Can't Get No Satisfaction, and I was like, what is this? And I, and I picked, I think I was, they're all great, but that one was particularly good because it's a live recording and it starts with, it starts with Under My Thumb with a great intro and it's a great album. And I bought that with my own money and such, you know, allowance money to the extent that was my own money. And, um, and that was when I woke up to rock and roll. And um, at the same time, I was, kind of, I was at an age in elementary school where I could, I could play one of the instruments in the elementary school band. And um, the cool instrument or my recollection of the cool instrument in the elementary school band was the saxophone. So 81, 82, I mean, anybody who's old enough to remember late 70s, 80s music knows the saxophone was a fairly That's true. Was, That's was true. A front and center instrument, right? Um, it never occurred to me to play guitar. So I, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to, when it's, when I can play, I'm going to play and I'm going to play the saxophone because that's a cool instrument. And I took my application home you know, for the instrument purchase. And I asked my mother like, okay, can I join the, can I join the elementary school band? And I I want to play saxophone. And she said, gotcha. So she took it to my father and my father's response um, apparently was, um, oh, hell no, 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 no. Because, you know, he was commuting all the way to New York City from northern New Jersey, right? So it's a walk to the bus, it's the bus into the city, it's a day in the city, it's the commute back to northern New Jersey. And the last thing they wanted was to listen to me go through the initial, you know, um, slightly melodic version of agonal breathing through a, through a saxophone. Uh, that just was a hard no. And so um, they issued me my no. And I think it was a couple of days and I got off the school bus about two days later, man. And my mother was waiting for me in the car. She said, in you go. And she drove, she said, I'm, we're heading to a music shop in Boonton, New Jersey, which was really an appliance store with guitars in the corner and some, some lesson rooms in the back. And she said, your father, your father didn't feel great about saying no. He's still good with saying no to the saxophone, but your father and I spoke and, um, he's good with you learning to play the guitar. And so I'm driving you to the shop and we're going to get you your first guitar and, uh, and sign you up for guitar lessons. And that was, that was how, how it started. And was it just kind of like love at first sight or whatever you call it when you pick up a guitar? <sighs> I, you know, they made, they made something okay that they, yeah, I mean, they just, that was the first time that was possible. Like I just, here I have the Rolling Stones still life. Here I am listening to Elvis type stuff. And now all of a sudden it's possible to play this stuff. Yeah. And so in, you know, to answer your question, yeah, man. And that's why when my guitar teacher who was, she was so cool, so cool. Her name was Susan Ludwig. And, um, you know, she put down the, um, the John Denver stuff and John Denver's great. You respect him immensely, you know, but it wasn't, I was in, I had, you know, I was in a rock and roll head space. And uh, so she's like, okay, well then she slides some Eagle stuff over and, you know, peaceful, easy feeling and all of that. I just, I just met uh, Jack Temption two weeks ago who wrote that song and we no got to way. jam with him. What? Yeah. We got to jam with him in, uh, in um, Carlsbad, which was so great. Um, but I was like, eh. cause again, rock and roll head. So she goes, well, what do you want to play? 
And I said, I want to play Hell's Bells by ACDC. Welcome to the Rangers. Here you go. There you go. A good indicator go. of where you were going to end up later on. Yeah. I was in, I don't know, fifth grade, fourth grade. I'd have to, I'd have to wow. do the math at this point. That's yeah. awesome. So she taught me to play Hell's Bells when I was in elementary school. That's great. So wh- one of the things that I think I had mentioned to you, my uh, my kids are guitar players now. So they're 10, 12, and 15. The, okay. the two older ones, when we lived in Paris a few years back, my I have zero musical inclination, but my wife insisted they start with something musical. So they did guitar. And we had this French guy come and teach them guitar. And this guy was mm-hmm. probably like 23 years old, black jeans, cool guy, came in and... It's like this is great for my kids, but I am never leaving my wife alone with this guy. So that was that was how we started out on this journey. Um, but they play today, and I will say, um, my oldest son just used his allowance to buy an electric guitar. It looks a lot like one on the wall behind you. I'm sure it doesn't cost quite as much, but um, he got that from editing the videos for Combat Story. So a big thank you to those who listen that made this possible, um, because now he's on a journey like that too. So that's very that's cool. great. Let, let me ask you this, Derek, with, and we had talked to Brad Thomas before, as you know, another unit guy who's, who's a, mm-hmm. in a band and, and has been musically inclined forever. I don't think I talked to him about this, but are there any lessons that might not be obvious here for people between what you've been asked to do at an elite level in the military, whether it's how you, how you move about the weapons, the choreography of it, um, that, that you learn from music? And I, I truly have no background in music and I cannot, I have no idea what the connections would be, but is there anything that you learn as a musician that you apply later on in the service? Oh yeah. Um, the, I mean, the creative problem solving, <clears throat> I, you know, ended up becoming a songwriter by avocation and um, that, you know, that creative process is a series of problems to solve the introduction, how do the verses go? How does the refrain go musically, lyrically? Are you going to put a bridge in there? If so, how are you going to do that? Um, how are you going to finish this thing off? You know, how do you tie everything together and uh, playing them over and over again? Emily Saliers from the Indigo Girls in one of her interviews talked about how she prefers to write songs in private because it's a very vulnerable experience which is a really i think nice way of probably of saying it's it's really an ugly experience because if you hear me zero in on something or any of us perhaps but i'll just speak for myself you know tweaking something dozens and dozens and dozens of times it is a lot easier to do that by yourself where nobody is around to listen to that evolution take place and so i found that when it came time to solve problems in the field, the ability to think creatively with the tools available, the cognitive tools yeah. available, um, really served me well. That makes total sense. Um, just briefly, why, why did you end up choosing the military when music seemed to be, and, re- and remains today, such an important part of your life? How, how hard was the decision for you to make the call to go into the military to begin with? It was a no brainer. Um, they were never mutually exclusive in my mind. And I, I was really, I, the the soldiering thing was a calling. It was really, really calling, particularly in our, in, in my household, in our household, you know, my father is the real deal. You know, he's a real deal combat veteran. And so, um, that was always there. I mean, I raided his closet and stole every every piece of uniform he had except his dress uniform because some things are you know hallowed and he didn't even need to tell me not to touch it but but his tiger stripe fatigues it's gone was i bothered about wearing them to school in seventh grade nope (laughs) happy to do it so and i was you know it was just you know and if i couldn't be i mean i was outside constantly constantly Um, in the woods, getting poison ivy every single year, driving my mother berserk with it because staying out of the woods was just impossible. And so I could, I could love music and I could love the idea of, of, of patrolling. 
Um, it never occurred to me to not do it. And in fact, when I tried to not do it, I, I sort of took myself off the rails for a few years until I just was true enough to myself to say, here we go. We're doing this. Yeah. And, and why choose the army when, when you have such a strong Marine Corps household? Oh uh, man, I appreciate the question. It's cause it's interesting. I, I, I did, um, I enlisted in the Navy. I did four years in the Navy active duty because I was going to go to be a SEAL. And um, I was initially classified as a crypto tech interpretive CTI, which was at the time, this was before the SO rating. That was a, what they called the source rating for, for, uh, for buds, for, for, for the SEALs. And so uh, I was really excited about that. The problem was that my mother was not a citizen because she's from Ireland. And so I couldn't get a clearance or an adequate clearance. So I did four years as an admin clerk. Fortunately, I got through it because I, I joined sort of an augmentation, augment, augmentation unit to the DOD police at a, at a submarine base on the West Coast that is closed now. And um, that, that kept me out of trouble. And then when I left, I still couldn't, I couldn't reclassify because my mother didn't have clearance. Uh, excuse me, citizenship. So I couldn't get a clearance. So I had did a break in service. I did some reserve time as a CB. And then during my break in service, two things happened. One is that I met Jennifer, my wife. And the other thing is that I met two retired Rangers. I had never spoken to Rangers before in my life. And I was working with these two guys in a job that I had. And they were... I mean, Ryan, you know that they're just, they're, they're different, right? They speak differently. They interact with each other differently. They interact with their teams differently. They, they are, their humor is different. They are, they just, they work differently. These are very focused life forms that just have this vibe and this capability. And I was like, man, where did you come from? And my mom got her citizenship. And I could go back on active duty and follow my special ops dream. And by then, I'd spend enough time with these two guys. And they didn't even recruit me, Ryan. I looked at those two and I was like, wherever they grow you is where I want to go. And that was the Ranger Regiment. Man. All right. I love that. I, I would be remiss if I didn't pick up on something you just mentioned. So you have a father who's from Italy and a mother from Ireland. And you grew up in northern Jersey. Is this right? Yeah. 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 So... Um, my father also flew Hueys in Vietnam. He also, he didn't do Air okay. America, but he did cross border kind of Laos, Cambodia type work as a Huey pilot. Okay. Um, grew up in Northern Jersey in East Rutherford okay. in a very Irish part of town though. And he was very clear. It was like an Irish part of town and an Italian part of town. And they didn't often mix. Where, <laughs> how did it go for you? For me? Yeah. I didn't have that. No, I don't okay. remember that being. I don't remember that being an issue. I remember my dad saying that when he showed up in New Brunswick, New Jersey, you know, with a British accent and all of the sort of this patrician air that came with, you know, my family from that time, he spent a lot of time defending himself from an ass whooping, you know, from the <laughs> from the from the kids in 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 the uh, in town there. Yeah, I think he had it harder than I did. For sure. That's interesting. Okay, great. So if we hop back on now, so you, you decide to go into the army, you've got Jennifer who ends up being um, your wife in the end. You consult her before you go in. Now that you kind of knew what you were getting into, you had done some time in the Navy and you understood a little bit more, I assume, than somebody who's just 17 making this decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was really concerned about what she would, you know, how she'd feel about it. But I, I wasn't, but I was comfortable having the conversation because I wanted to do it so badly. Um, but she was at, she was, she was out of town for the week. And, um, you know, I'd gone to the recruiter's office without really talking to anybody and um, even signed the paperwork without really talking to anybody. <laughs> and um, it was, it was funny, the connection we've been together 23 years now this month married for 22 and wow. this December and um the connection is, is is really it's something I marvel at all the time because she called 
Jennifer called and I said, uh, I said, Hey, it was all it was, Ryan. Right. I was it. Hey, Hey. And she goes, what's going on? I'm like, what do you, <laughs> she could just tell. Yeah. I said, Women's one, intuition. one word. She's like, what's going on? And I said, okay, well, I told her, I said, RV recruiting office. And I was just waiting. I was waiting for whatever came next. And I really wasn't ready for what came next. It really, because, there was the pause and I'm like, here it comes. I'm about to lose my girlfriend. And she goes, I've known you for a year, year and a half now. And I've known the entire time that you wanted to go back on active duty and finish what you started. She said, so I want you to know that I support you and that I, I love you and I will follow you wherever you go. Damn. Not many people yeah. hear that. Not many people hear that. That's amazing. Especially the communities you came out of. I don't obviously don't know what the statistics are, but keeping keeping that together, the family together is not easy with that lifestyle. That's impressive. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know the deal. You've done it too. Yeah. 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 So as we were prepping, you mentioned you're in Afghanistan just after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Can you can you share with us? Where were you at in your career at that time? And what would, how important was it for you to be there then? What was it like? Yeah. So we were, when the towers went down, we were, we were at a, you know, we got paged out. I was still at first range. I was at first ranger battalion. And admittedly, I, I wasn't there very long. Um, you know, things started moving quickly. And, and um, you know, when I, once Jennifer and I got married, I, you know, I had a family to support, you know, quickly and not a lot of money to do it. So I, I needed to do my job. I needed to do my job. Well, I needed to be committed to my, to my, to my squad and, and that sort of thing for sure. But I also had to earn a living for my family. And so on E4 pay, that's, those are lean times. And so um, I was at 175. We got, we got uh, paged out to, um, to an Idri, um, you know, to, to an exercise that, you know, wheels up and, you know, be in the platoon area in an hour, wheels up in X many hours, and then we're flying to the we're flying to the UK, and um, we went ahead and we were in Fairford RAF Fairford, and we they they sort of there was a hangar there it was essentially our ISOFAC isolation facility, and um, and then from there the leaders went did the leaders recon in Hungary. And we were going to jump into Hungary on a counter proliferation mission profile. So there we are in the hangar, hiding, like isolated. And we didn't know what was going on. And the first sergeant came in. Okay, you've done exercises. You know how this goes. Someone comes in and they give you the scenario, initiates the troop leading procedures from there. We essentially issue the warning order. And then you, you go and, you know, go for the next step in the tailpiece. In comes the first sergeant and said, hey, gather around, men, check it out. And then tell us the story of what happened at the World Trade Center. Terrorists hijacked planes, crashed them into the, crash them into the World Trade Center, all this, he's describing the whole thing. Brian, you've got all of Bravo Company, 175 in a hangar, and we were like, oh, good one. Yeah, good one. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. New exactly. scenario. We like, exactly. Right. Who this is going to be? What? I mean, cool. Creative. This is what we're Creative. Doing. Yeah. I know, right? Because it's so berserk. Yeah. Only JSOC can come up with something this nuts. This this off the chain. So, um, he's like, he goes, no, seriously, man. Like, I'm I'm being serious. We're like, yeah, you are. We got it, first sergeant. You're serious. Understand? Because nobody wants to spend the next four days doing push-ups. We're like, Roger that, first sergeant. We're ready for whatever. Let's go. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> he walks away. He's like, oh, you stupid guys. So somebody comes back with a black and white television and the antenna and all of that, and they put it down on some flat surface and turn it in. And there's, there's the company wow. standing around this thing. And it went on. And we caught it just in time to see, or a recording rather, you know, of of the of the buildings dropping, and that was like just just the silence, like 
you only hear in certain certain circumstances. And um, to a man, this would uh, I get goosebumps when I think about it. To a man, turned around, went back to our cots. Guys sat down and they started doing PCIs. Man, checking tie downs, checking mags, checking sensitive items, as if like as if they are ready to step off right now. It was amazing to watch them respond like that. Anyway, fast forward, um, we went back, um, 375 jumped in, as you know, and then 175 went in after, you know, and of course Alpha Company, you know, portion of Alpha, Alpha Company was up on Roberts Ridge, ACO was there, we, BCO stayed back, and then it was during that time that um, they sent me to Ranger School. So I went to pre-ranger in October of 01 and then graduated from Ranger. Cause you don't stay in, if you don't graduate from Ranger school, you don't get to stay in Ranger regiment. That's it. And so um, they sent, I went to Ranger school. I got, I graduated in February of 02, got back and was a member of the, of the, of the spec four mafia, right? Tabs, <laughs> tab spec four, the spec four mafia. <laughs> waiting for a chance to become a team leader. And all the team leaders in the company were, well, in the battalion that I recall, they were all brand new. And so that's a two year wait to be a team leader. And they were, um, they called us into the, into the CP and, and said um, they need, they need someone from regiment to go to JSOC to the command directorate um, to work on the general staff. It was, it was general's driver, CG's driver, but it was really, it was, it was driver, but it was also his executive protection detail. So personal protection is one thing. Executive protection is another. It's maximizing their time, keeping them safe, keeping them free of embarrassment and making sure their life is streamlined so they can do what they need to do. And we were all standing there. And the, if you want to end up in trouble with the guys, you, you know, act like you're interested in leaving battalion. So they said, we need volunteers for this thing. Who wants to go? Well, you've got, you know, four or five members of the spec four mafia who are only supposed to be interested in waiting to become team leaders. So we're looking at each other to see which, which who's dumb enough to raise his hand. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not raising my hand. Okay. Got gents. Uh, you'll get cool schools. You'll get shooting schools and you'll get driving schools and all of that. And then they wait and we're like, yeah, don't care. Not doing it. I'm not raising my hand. And then they go, and you'll get boarded immediately for E5. And I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Because uh, I had children. I had a wife, and I had two children. And so um, I did. I did. I did for the money. And so, um, but it actually was an enormous blessing because I got to go to Afghanistan the first time as a member of General Daly's staff wow. general del daily and so i got to you know i got to afghanistan a few weeks before before my company got there and i got to do you know i got to do excuse i i, I we you know because we were with the jsoc cg there were things that we did that i got to experience it was two yeah. years of special operations university and if I did my army career again, 10 times over, I would do the same thing. Man. Wow. So, oh, it was so how, cool. how hard was it, Derek, at that time with what was going on with the war to not be able to go in with, with the team, I guess, or with the, with the battalion in that team leader position for you? Yeah, I, I regretted that a lot. I struggled with that. I did, um, quite a bit. Um, Fortunately, we were kept busy enough in the staff, and I had a great ranger buddy who's uh, a friend of mine to this day, Chuck Eastman, and um, he went and flew Apaches after his regiment time. He and I were on JSOC, the staff together, and, and um, we met in 02. We actually did the handoff in Bagram. That's where we met, and um, and uh, the JSOC Command Sergeant Major was really the guy we worked for, um, C.W. Thompson, great, great NCO. I'm, I'm just – so blessed to have had a chance to work for him. And, um, 
he said, you two have two years and then you're on to something else. What's it going to be? You know, and he, and he said it kindly. I, I'm not doing it his tone justice. It was great mentorship. Like, let's have a counseling session and talk about what you're going to do next. I never had a lot of time to, to feel too badly about, about how I stacked up against my, my peers and, you know, you know, in battalion because we were extremely busy. We took, you know, we took, um, we took the generals, you know, we yeah. accompanied the generals into the invasion, you know, of Iraq. We did all, I mean, we were constantly gone. So it wasn't that I wasn't busy and it wasn't that I wasn't going out, you know, into the, you know, yeah. into the places doing dangerous things. And then with the clock ticking on, you'll do two years, two years and not a day more. What's it going to be next? And, and um, I knew from the moment I joined the army and had a RIP contract that I wanted to assess for the Delta Force. I knew that from the beginning. And so I know, knew that during the two years I was at JSOC that my next move would be to take the long walk. And so my answer to your question was that if, if I was successful in that, then I would make up for the fact that I wasn't a team leader in battalion because then I could be a member of that organization. If that didn't work, it would be another special operations organization. I would get there one way or the other. Yeah. So just for people who are listening, because not, not everybody who listens to this um, is a veteran or has the military background. So the idea that you would be on a general staff might sound odd, I think, to people, but that's a very, that is a coveted, very important position on the officer side. If you're a general's aide, it's a, I mean, you come out of the line duty for a couple of years, but you are just soaking up everything you can. You're right with the, the staff as you were, you probably saw things that you would n never have seen at that rank in any other part oh, of the army. No, I mean, yeah. and, and even, and a joint community at that. It must be yeah, yeah. It was fascinating. Thank you for that, Ron. I really appreciate that. And not only was it fascinating, but the, the, the extraordinary blessing to that was getting to meet Tony Thomas when he was <laughs> the chief of staff. Oh my God. Um, Bill McRaven, when he was the when he was the DCGO, I mean to be able to to see Admiral McRaven on a daily basis, to see to be there for the change of command from General Daly, who was a really great person to work for, and I'm I'm thankful every day for it. To then General McChrystal, Jesus, um, that's amazing to be able to, and all of these these gentlemen, you know, who became leaders and ladies too who became these leaders in the task force and then in other units, I got to meet all of them and there was no other way to do that. And it was really, really special. Would, do you remember, was there anything that you picked up from a leadership perspective or just the way that you approached work that you learned from watching them or through osmosis or whatever, being around people at that, uh, the Sergeant majors you must've been around were probably had to have been heavy hitters, the generals, um, yeah, anything yeah. that you picked up that you ended up using later on? I could tell you a lot of stories, and, and some of them would be, um, I, 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 you know, there are a few things that I'll, I'll edit on just for my own. <clears throat> but the one that, the one that just, just in, yeah, um, the one that really stands out for me in answer to your question was, was Sergeant Major Thompson. When, you know, we didn't, we were packed, Chuck and I were packed for Afghanistan for our, I don't know, fourth trip or something like that. I mean, during that time period, Ryan, I was only home for three weeks at a time and I was only home long enough to do things like PLBC or something like that. Then it was right back out. A, a training course so, for those who don't know what that is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. For E5. Um, so about three weeks at the most, and then we were back out the door. And so, um, we were packed for Afghanistan when we got the word that we were going to Iraq instead. And I didn't, we didn't understand that. And I remember CW, you know, Sergeant Major Thompson, CW Thompson, he said, gents, uh, a good NCO understands his commander's intent and he backs him on it, whether he agrees or not. And he goes and he, it's some version of that. Like you will do your job. It's not up to you to agree with what the chain of command does or doesn't do. It's up to you to support them and support these people in that. That's what you need to do. And I, 
that worked for a very long time until until it didn't right there's a point in time in a career i was i was told and i experienced it myself you you wake up one day and you know you're finished you know you're you know you're done you know and that happened many years many years later many many years later but before that point in time there were plenty of things that i didn't understand there were plenty of things that that maybe i wouldn't have i wouldn't have gone out on but that's not my option Right. I exercised my option when I joined that unit. And now you'll do, you'll, you know, and Ben Sokolik, you know, now retired General Sokolik, when he, when we got into the unit, he said, um, he said, welcome to the unit, gents. Uh, we just started at TC. He said, here's how this is going to work. Um, I'm going to issue you my intent. I am not going to tell you how to execute on that intent, except to say that it needs to be legal, moral, ethical. And you need to win. If you need anything from me, let me know and I'll get it for you. Right. What are your questions? Well, I, I mean, I don't, I, we don't have any, but that's, it, you know, it, that level of trust means going back to what CW said. As soon as the unit commander issues his intent, that's it. You're doing that. That's great. What an interesting experience. But um, I'd like so, to just yeah. say before we move on, if you don't mind, yeah, I was very lucky because I had a great. I worked for organizations with a great mission essential task list with officers who, when they said things, you're like, of course that's what we need to do, right? It wasn't hard in the place I was in to get behind what they wanted. I mean, if Scott, if Scott, General Scott Miller said we're going to do this, or at the time it was Colonel. Scott Miller. If Scott Miller wanted to issue intent on something, that was a very, very easy sell. Because you just had so much faith in the decisions they'd made in the past. Is that where it comes from? Or you think like they, they probably aren't in that position because they had made bad decisions before? Yeah, that would probably be part of it. But when you're in the room with these particular leaders, it, it just, um, they just have a thing. These are just abundantly, clearly capable war yeah. fighters. Yeah. You know? So, so you get done with that two-year rotation. You go to selection. Well, I, I want to hear about selection, but I also don't want to miss out on some of the learnings that you'd shared with me previous to this about the sure. experiences you had in combat. So we'll weave it in. But suffice to say, you get through selection, you get to your squadron at the unit. Can you take us mm -hmm. to the first time you're in combat now with the unit? And, and to be clear, Derek, just make sure I'm, I got this straight. This is the first time you're in combat is with the unit. Yeah, I'd been in combat zones and I mean zones, I'd sorry. invaded yep. Yep. I I'd, I'd been in combat zones nonstop since August of 02 yes. and I invaded a country, right? I mean, flew into Biap right after 3rd ID took it, cleared it and you know, I, I was in combat zones, but the first time you know, the first time the adversary you know, the adversary's team and my team pointed guns at each other was when I was a member of A Squad. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Can you take us to, to wherever you were the first time you really had to experience what that was like? Yeah. The training process is so intense and so effective. The thing that um, I, the only thing I cared about was doing it well. The troop commander at the time, John Braga, who's now, you know, now a, a commanding general over at uh, USASAC. Um, great officer, uh, great team leaders. I was in Mosul. We went to Mosul. It was Mosul in 05. Um, so it was really just, I, I remember the thing that, that, that was on my mind the most, Ryan, was wanting, A, wanting to get on target with these people, and B, wanting to execute to a no-fail mission standard. Because when you come out of OTC and you're in your first 18 months of probationary status in the squadron, you want are utterly driven to execute to a no-fail mission standard. Coupled with the fact that, that when you when you pile on the hostage rescue mission profile, and we did, we were on the Roy Hallam's rescue. I was on the Roy Hallam's rescue during the JSOC surge of this year. You don't care. You care about nothing else except getting that hostage out, 
and serving the guys well in the process. That is it. That is all you care about. One of the, uh, I'll bring this back to a question about how you did this with family, because I think that's a very different approach than somebody who's <laughs> single going through this and has more flexibility. But just when I was at the agency, some of the, the advanced training that we went through, I do remember somebody saying, oh, you've got three kids or two kids. You got one on the way. Like you, you have no chance of making it through this. Like mm -hmm. your, your mind's going to be elsewhere. To go through something as intense as OTC for two years or however long it is, you know, that, that length of time. And then to be so driven for that first 18 months, which I'm sure doesn't end at 18 months, but really because of the probationary nature. How did you balance it with the family? Um, it's an interesting question, Ryan, because the other part of that is that, um, and I'll talk around a thing here, but it factors yep. in. There's a certain, at that time, for sure, there was a certain um, reduced signature capability baked into what we did, right? So when there was a, which meant that I left myself Got here, it. right? I left that here. And the so room, for people who are, who are watching, and you're just listening, showing the wedding ring, had to leave that to the side. Right. That person yeah. stayed here. You know the deal. And that, yeah. So forward, when, when Jennifer or Jacob or Emily, you know, my wife and my children would enter my mind, I had to flush that. I had to push that back during the duty day for sure. And in the beginning, it was understandable and justifiable. And I was, you know, I was down with it. No problem, really. The problem came from doing that over and over and over and over and over again. Double digit deployments, double digit number of years. And then you would find me like, I, I, I had a moment when, <laughs> many moments, but I had one moment that relates to this when I got out where I had this reckoning and I, and I literally said to her, I go, what have I done? What have I done? You know, backburnering my family like that. What did I do? And she was like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? You're, you, that never happened. Like, that's not how it looked to us because, you know, at the end of the duty deck, we couldn't, I couldn't tell Jennifer where I was or where we were or what we were doing, but we had a system where at the when operations for the day were done, I'd get on the Iridium satellite phone and call him. Come back, put your gear up, do the hot wash, the after action review, right? Um, maybe go get chow, you know, if, right? And then get on the phone and, and call as soon as I could. And Jennifer for 13 and a half years would wait for that phone call. And I was rushing to make it because that was our way of touch of connecting. And that was our, my way of letting her know that we were back and okay. Yeah. Without being able to say anything. And so we could be on the Roy Hallam's rescue, pull him out of the hole, get him back and, and, and send him on his way to live the rest of his life and then get on the phone with Jennifer and we can't talk about any of that stuff. So we talk about the recital that Emily went to and the dog going to the vet and, Jake poked himself in the eye with a, with a, with a, you know, with a, you know, milk straw or something like that, you know, uh, you know, at school, I went to the nurse, that's the stuff we would talk about. And so she said to me, and then when I would get home, I would try to get home as soon as possible. But, you know, even still in garrison, it was just training and training and training. And so over the years, the thing that I, that caused the kind of damage I had to come to grips with was, was just the number of times I had to push them from the front of my mind to somewhere in the back and then love them later. And that man, when I had to pay the bill for that, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Oh man, you can, you can feel it as you're talking about it. So it comes through. <clears throat> um, you mentioned the, the Roy Hallam's uh, rescue. Is that something you're able to talk through kind of like how, how it went down? And if not, no problem. And we'll edit that out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Just what, what yeah, is yeah. that like? And, and maybe the mindset that you have to have going into that. Cause as you said, like, that's all you're thinking about. How do you approach that? And what did it, how did it play out? 
So I won't say anything. I won't say anything classified, yep. and um, I, I won't. I won't do that. But um, so we had we were spread out across multiple areas. We split the area of op- the large area of operations up into multiple spaces and different task forces. Then we created different task forces. They created different task forces to handle the um, the you know the the load the operational load in those different areas. And so we were in Baghdad. My, the, the portion of the organ, the portion of the squadron I was with on that deployment was in Baghdad. And then another team was in a, was in another, another city, a, a famous one problem area for sure. And they worked that area effectively and uh, run by a really, really, really capable team. They were all super capable, but that was a much smaller footprint thing, and there was an intensity level to that. That I, that uh, my recollection is that it was an elevated intensity level. Anyway, they got they met trigger for a certain target, a certain high value, a certain a person, yeah. high value target, and um, went and hit that, went to that objective, and managed to secure get that individual into custody. And then found from that individual that they knew somebody else in the network, in their network who was in Baghdad. And so we got that call and we went and hit that target and got that individual. I was on that one and I saw things that I I saw people do things that I I don't, I I don't, I don't know that I would have, I would have had a hard time meeting somebody who's an exaggerating if I hadn't seen it for myself. And so like this person was, this man was really protecting his secret and he was using every trick he could to try to avoid answering the questions. And through the creative problem solving of those guys on target, we got there. But I will tell you that that was the time when I stopped being delicate around my teammates. I stopped being the junior guy because this individual was doing certain things to avoid answering questions that were fair questions to ask under the circumstances. And I remember he pretended to pass out for like the third time. And I remember just blowing right through the line. My, you know, my guys were there and I just came out of myself and, and just grabbed him and, and, and just put elevated him up on the wall. And I remember just looking at him and I grabbed the interpreter and I, and I'm a new guy, right? I mean, at this point I've been there nine months 10 months or something, but I just had this fire man in my guts. And I said to the tarp, tell him this. I said, there is no version of this where Roy Hallams does not come home. You dig? Tell him. And, you know, he still played the game a little bit. And then one of the, one of the team leaders came up with a really interesting way that I won't discuss here of, compelling him to change his perspective Got it. on how he would deal with us. It wasn't violent. It, it wasn't like that. Um, it was really, really, it was a social engineering move. It was totally brilliant. Um, so if Bill, if Bill is listening, I will say, Bill, I never forgot that it was the slickest thing I've ever seen anybody do. Um, and after that, we got him back to the mission support site and they, he answered the questions. And the next day we were flying out to hit to, to to recover Roy Hallams. And if you I, I was there for the build up for the you know when every when the task force came in to to Leal Air Base to recover Jessica Lynch and to stand on that flight line and watch the amount of committed selfless affection and determination to bring that lady home. Uh, you have to be there to believe it just people descending on it because you could not keep anybody who was able to go there away from bringing that lady back home. And the thing with, with the Roy Hallens thing was we flew out there and um, I was in an incredible troop at the time and nobody cared about anything other than getting that man back. And what they had done was that they had stuck him in, in a crawl space under a house with a cell door with a padlock over it. And then a, the marble floor form fit, tightly fit into the hole with, a, with a, a rug over it, a carpet over that, a freezer on top of that. 
women and children living there and then the men running that 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 holding facility you could have walked back and forth for nine months have no idea that man was down there wow and when we pulled him out I mean, if you want to see what 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 give a damn looks like, you watch a bunch of you watch a bunch of special operators, whether they're from my unit or the folks at the beach or any of the other units that have ever been blessed to execute on that mission set. It was absolute stoic, full speed determination to get that man home with zero regard for anything other than than his welfare. Was it a contentious objective? How so? What do you mean? Uh, were, did, did it get kinetic going on to that objective? No, it didn't. It didn't. You know, it, it, I appreciate the question. I, it, it didn't. And I think anybody who would have stayed there, and anyone from the other side who would have stayed there for any length of time, um, you know, I, I guess it's safe for me to say this because it didn't go that way. I've been in gunfights later. Um, you know, I mean, you know, from the, you know, from what you know about the target that Josh Wheeler died on, you know, when we, when they went back, you're, if you want to throw down, if you want to throw down with guys from the unit, you, you will back off. They will not ever. Gosh. I just, I had recently interviewed Billy Billingham, who's a retired UK SAS Sergeant major did 30 years in and w- I don't want to, I'm not speaking for him here. I think I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase, but he described a hostage rescue operation, I believe in Iraq bank, pulled somebody out and he just said, Hey, we're British SAS. This is who we are. You're going home. And he said it was the, the best feeling he'd ever had. It's the best feeling ever. The only time I've ever felt that good. The only other times I ever felt that good was when Jennifer said yes to marrying me and when my son was born. I mean, it feels good on that level, man. Yeah. Oh, man. So, um, all right, if we change gears just a little bit from where things go right, the way you just described with a hostage rescue to times where things don't quite go the way you want with a weapon malfunction, something that you had mentioned as we were preparing for this. Can you talk us through what happened for that scenario? Yeah. 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 Um, at the coldest I've ever been in my life is in the desert in Iraq. And we, we got a target and we flew, I was about an hour, somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half helicopter ride. And like, this isn't one of those like, okay, it was, this is how cold it was. This how, like it was, it was freezing cold and we flew out. It was, you know, I normally would fly with the doors open, um, shut those doors. Of course, there's still, you know, the deal, right? The, the yeah. air is coming through where the, where the mini guns are sticking out. And cold is cold. Just sitting on a cold floor in a black Hawk. It was just amazingly cold. And, um, we, you know, six minutes comes, the six minute call comes, the doors open. One minute call comes. We're, you know, getting ready to, you know, taking the, you know, you know, getting our carabiners off the loops and holding the guys in the door and, you know, getting, you know, getting ready now to flare. And, <clears throat> and man, these rounds just start coming and we were going to hit this compound in the middle of the door. And you could see the tracers come in and then you could see the contrails from the RPG rounds. We were like, they're shooting, they're shooting RPGs at us. Really? And then just, just this, you know, just trying to lay suppressive fire down and blow up whatever they heard. Well, they didn't have nods at that time, fortunately. And that's a lot of fire, man. Right. And, and then the birds land and there was a, you know, there was a bit of a hill. So, you know, the stuff would, was kind of coming. We were good. Not great, but we were okay. We got out of the birds. It was like all of a sudden had zero concept of how cold it was. Zero. Went from freezing to not even thinking about it, which is an interesting thing about combat. Don't think about how hot it is. Don't think about how thirsty you are in that moment. And um, so we get on, we set up a line and the guys, you know, we all start laying fire down. There's a guy that comes out in the door and he's got this machine gun at his hip. You know, it's like a bad movie. 
and he's just and I thought and I remember looking I just I was looking at this line of dudes and I was like just just throwing down right and I I look at this guy in the door and I'm like oh yeah this is the shot I've been, you know this kind of shot is the shot we trained for I'm like you're not I mean, you don't get to take a shot at my guys like this, right? This is just not going to happen. This is your day, man. And I put, I put my, I put my dot where it needed to go, and I went to squeeze off a, a control pair, and boom, click. So through the training, it's it's tap rack, put it on, boom, click. And I was like, no. I have this fancy ass space gun. And it just, there was a certain round we were using and the port pressure, particularly given how cold it was, the port pressure wasn't high enough to cycle the bolt carrier group all the way back. It would cycle to bring the hammer back and recock the weapon. It didn't cycle far enough back to pick up the next round and chamber it. So I basically had a bolt gun. Here I am in the gunfight of my life to that point. And my gun doesn't work. And fortunately, I had the grenade launcher attached to that gun. So I, I went ahead and started launching 40 millimeter HEDP, 40 millimeter, high, 40 millimeter high explosive grenades, you know, at the target. It's not what I wanted to do. The irony of all ironies is that I, I was in a sniper troop. So here I am, a sniper, and now I'm just <laughs> lobbing fist-sized objects, you know, kind of, you know, swagging to get him into the door where this guy is. But once I got that, and I remember I launched my first one, and then I went to open it, and I went to get around, and I looked, and I could see down the line my entire troop, da-da-da-da, da-da-da, and just looking at this bunch of warfighters getting after it. And I just gave myself the second to register this because I was like, brother, this is one of those things you are going to remember for the rest of your life. And it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen is this. And here's what I loved about it. These guys standing shoulder to shoulder, throwing down. It was awesome. And then I just went back to just launching 40 millimeter rounds at the target. And I've, I mean, I've, I have blown a lot of stuff up in my life, but that night, man, I got to outdo myself. And, um, and they all did too. We suppressed the target and I was like, okay, you know, BDA, here we go. Looking forward to that. Let's, you know, see what we, what we accomplish. And of course, get, do the sensitive site exploitation because that's the thing that drives the find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze process. I don't want to come off as somebody who likes to be unsure. But anyway, to answer your question, yeah. The damn rifle wouldn't work. So I had to go. Fortunately, the grenade launcher worked uh, and I got to contribute. And then after that, once they suppressed, they just opted to drop the whole thing. And so they called in a pair of 500 pound bombs on the objective and we went home. But while we were waiting for those bombs to come in, we're standing there. And at that point, everything's quiet. And the cold literally came up through the soles of my boots. Then we got back to being able to think about how cold it was and it was just frigid. So I've not used, I've not shot a 40 mil HEDP round. How many of those are you carrying with you that you can sustain in a fight? Like, do you have, how many, how many of those rounds do you have on you at any time? I guess. So for those listening, you know, an actual grenadier on a fire team has what we used to call the suicide vest because it's just a basic load of, like a lot of these things, you're just draped in explosives as a grenadier on a fire team. But the way we would do it, because it wasn't, and that's that grenadier, the grenadier is, that's his primary weapon. But there was no suicide vest of, you know, 40 millimeter rounds on, on, on us. So what we did is we distributed them across the troop. And so I would carry four of them, six of them, eight of them, I forget at this point. And then every single dude had at least two. And then they would just feed them to you. Got it. So you were kind of like, hey, send those down the line. Get me, get me some more rounds. All right. Yeah, yeah. And they just magically showed up. Like I didn't even have to ask. They just kept <laughs> showing up. Is that at times like that, I, I'm sure it's chaotic because you said, as you said, you're online, you're putting rounds down range. But is there any joking that goes on with like, way to go, Derek? 
gun malfunction, but you, you didn't check it or it, does that happen in those moments or is it, does it take place later on or at that level, you just don't even do that anymore? Oh, so there, there is joking. And I do want to say before I answer it that, you know, I do, I do recognize that, you know, people on the other end of it, you know, the adversary believed in a cause and they were trying to support themselves and live a lifestyle. So I don't want to be, I do not want to be flippant or, or vulgar in, in failing to acknowledge that there was a group of people on the other end of that um, fight who were doing what they believed in and they lost their lives. And, and um, that's, that's the reality of it. So before I talk about the funny stuff, that's, that's yeah, real well and put. it's not funny. That's true. Yeah. But um, so about two or three deployments before that, I'd gotten my dream army school, which was the special operations target interdiction course, which is, which we used to sock the United States army special operations version of sniper school. They call it something else now. And I, I just lose track of the things that the army calls stuff after a while. I just don't even, but I went to, I went to Sodic and I got, that was when I became a proper Delta force sniper. And the funny thing is that we were the VI, we, as I was going to graduate from Sodic finally be a full-fledged sniper in 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 the recce troop and then the i was i the guys were deploying when i was graduating so i would graduate and then i would join them overseas so i show up overseas a newly minted totally dialed in like can do the math in my sniper math in my head sniper and all about it i, I get to do my first deployment as an actual sniper qualified sniper. And what happens? My team leader, Jimmy, hey Jimmy, uh, hope you're doing well. He meets me, walks me to our hooch. He's walking me through, you know, who's doing what in this mission, in this particular mission profile. He's like, yeah, Glennie's doing this, and Mikey's doing this, and we're doing this, and India team's doing this, and Kilo team's doing this, and Jackal team's the stopper, and all of that. And he's walking me to our hooch, and he's like, yeah, here's our hooch, here's Kilo team's hooch, this is our main area right here, let me walk you back to where our bunks are, so there's my bunk, there's Glennie's, there's Mikey's bunk, and there's your bunk, and um, there's your M203 grenade launcher, uh, you're the grenadier on this trip, hey, congratulations on graduating from Sodic, slaps me <laughs> on the back and walks away, he's like, well, I'm not, oh, really, oh, man, so, you know, and we would, there was a certain SOP to launching that, to do it to, that we would kick off a certain portion of that mission profile with me having to launch a grenade. And that, you know, the mass casually, the anyway, has, highest casually producing thing. And then that would kick off what would happen next. Well, I wasn't, I hadn't spent the last eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks training on launching grenades effectively, right? So, when I had to launch my first one on that trip in combat, what do you think happened? It wouldn't surprise you to hear that I sent that grenade well past the target. <laughs> now, at that point, they're looking at me, they're like, you know, then, then the jokes start. And of course, I'm like, oh, God. So then I've got to try to make the adjustment. And at this point, everybody's watching. And then the jokes start. <laughs> so when we went and did... So then after just, just so you know, like that deployment, I went to the ammo supply point and I was like, give me all the 40 millimeter training chalk rounds you've got, right? Because I've got to go to the range and I've got to dial my stuff in. So, but, I, you know, the damage was done, right? I'm the guy that, I'm the guy that will put a, you know, 40 millimeter round kind of not where it should go, even though that wasn't necessarily true. Um, it only has to be true once, Ryan. Yeah, that's true. And so that particular target that you talked about, um, I, I wasn't. I was. I was trying to recover from how mortified and thoroughly irritated I was that my super awesome space gun didn't like the cold very much. And then I'm, you know, and rounds are incoming, so I go and I transition to the grenade launcher. Not a drill I did very often. <laughs> so when I went to launch my first one, and I was trying to figure out what the distance was, I sent that round down. And it exploded just a little bit past the arming distance for that round and <laughs> blew up. And the guys, one of the guys on the line goes, oh, my God, they're launching RPGs at us. And in the middle of this whole gunfight, a guy goes, here's the best part. He goes, no, 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 that's just Derek. That's just Derek launching grenades. <laughs> and the guys were like, 
Oh, oh yeah, it's Derek. <laughs> it's Derek. He's got the grenade launcher. That is so good. All right. I, I did want to take a moment here because you're talking about training. You mentioned Sodic. You mentioned how cold it is as well. And I have to imagine with the, play, the units you've been with, you've been cold before. So you just say this is like the coldest you've been is saying something. In moments like that, do you, probably not at the time, but as you come off of something like that or you look back on it, does it reinforce like that's why ranger school had to suck or why selection was such a long walk? Like, does it reinforce the idea of how oh, important yeah. that training was to get you to yeah. push through that? Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the great things about the combat arms is, is well, any of them, but I can only speak for combat arms, is is the field craft we learned. And I, I'm sure you would have learned some of it in the seer component of what you did, right? You had to learn how to be cold properly. I'm, I was a winter ranger, so I went through a winter, a yeah. winter class. And there's a whole batch of field craft that, um, that they teach you in order to be, you know, to be able to get through that and, and, and spend four, seven, ten days in a field problem out in the cold and be able to, you know, be able to continue mission. And so we're trained for that sort of stuff. You're never trained to not be cold. But you're trained to be able to manage it and survive it and be able to win the day. Yeah. And we'll, I want to have time to talk about music course. So I'm going to ask you just one other event, if you can talk us through, and then sure. I want to build on onto the TVI discussion that we had earlier. Yeah. So I was, I was surprised when, when we were preparing for this, talking about maybe one of the more difficult, dangerous um, operations or, or something that you thought could go sideways, that you actually brought up something that was more of a singleton type environment, which makes sense after you mentioned it. But could you kind of talk about, it's, again, nothing classified, but just the mindset that that it requires and however much of the profile you can share and stay on the, the right side mm -hmm. of things here? Yeah. <clears throat> the battlefield evolved, as you know. And um, the enemy evolved as its understanding of our tactics, techniques, and procedures evolved. Some things they understood correctly and some things they didn't. Um, so as they changed, we changed. And um, there was a point in time at which there was an investment across the specialized units in certain low vis capabilities they were very very niche they were very intense they were very heavily invested in low visibility capabilities which is the which is the best version of it that i can offer you know here or yep. really anywhere and that low visi low visibility operating opportunity came to me i transitioned from when i realized what was going on and saw things changing and um um, I could have kept, I could have stayed with guys that I become really bonded to and, and, and uh, cared about very much and continue doing those things. But I really had become acquainted through a series of deployments with, with the find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze process. Um, I, I would be lying by omission if I just didn't tell you that it was manhunting. And that's, you know, that was it. And the enemy, the enemy, the adversary and us were really engaged with each other in this, in this back and forth, trying to be successful in the field. And so um, it was really meaningful to both the adversary and to us to be able to, you know, to engage with each other, you know, in, in, in the battle space in a way that, that was the changed that changed the battlefield one way or the other. And so I had reached the point where, you know, I, I'd reached the point where I wanted to be a part of that evolution. And so I volunteered to leave a squadron and go to another part of the organization, you know, to do what they did, which was more low visibility work. And when I got there, they had set up, were in the process of setting up a low visibility capability within that, that had a whole separate assessment and training component to it. And, um, and, um, they asked if I had wanted, if I was willing to help set that up and, and, and be one of the first members of that, of that, um, of that troop. And, uh, I mean, that was not, that was not a hard ask, man. I couldn't say yes fast enough. And I did that. Um, but it was singleton work forward singleton, you know, for meaning that's it. Nobody's, 
there you're not there with friends you're not there with teammates that's you know you're you, you know that person's on their own operating on their own but saying that pretends that there isn't a cross functional team backing that singleton with an extraordinary amount extraordinary amount of research and development and mission analysis and training and preparation so that by the time that singleton launches that really ends up being kind of the easiest part of the whole thing yeah and when you're when you're executing on that op the first time you're on your own and obviously not talking about any places but mentally how how different is it from like getting on a helo that's flaring and hitting a target um there's a lot of responsibility to get it right. Um, and there's a lot of responsibility to be trustworthy operationally. And, um, you know, that is a mission profile that makes any responsible leader kind of nervous. There's no cast. There's no going to the embassy on this particular profile. There's, there are no uniforms. There are no, um, all of that stuff is, yeah. is none of that is available. And so it has to be done. It has to be done fluidly. You've got to be able to think creatively and adjust with the circumstances on the ground. Um, and I will tell you that my recollection of that at the risk of sounding sensational is that everything is your fault. Everything, right? If it doesn't go right, your fault. If somebody gets, if things aren't staffed properly as, as the team, it's just, there's a lot of liability, which is okay. Everything's got, I'm not doing a very good job explaining this. There's just an intensity level. Yeah. There's a, there is a responsibility in executing on that mission profile. That is, um, that has a, there's a lot of responsibility placed on the singleton to do it, to do it properly. A lot coupled with so much so that really the danger and this is, I mean, this isn't wrong. I mean, this isn't right. I, but the danger, it, you know, is, is, is much seemed less significant. To, it was significant for sure, but disappointing, letting that cross-functional team and the leadership down, not executing well, really seemed to be a much higher stake thing in my heart than whether or not, you know, everything on, target when I was there by myself was a hundred percent safe. I never, I mean, the risks that you take in something like that are absolutely extraordinary, but the risk of failing seems far worse. Yeah. Oh man. All right. So what I'm going to try to do here is transition us a bit to, as you, as you start recognizing the TBI, as you deal with it and music core, Something yeah. that you had mentioned as we were preparing that really struck me. I've definitely heard it from a few folks before, but this idea that you could never really allow yourself to enjoy, I can't remember the exact wording, something like the victory experience. You're always on to the next thing and you can hear it with you, like Ranger Battalion, um, you're with the general staff. Sodic is probably just one of many courses that you got to go to, to, to push yourself mm -hmm. and, you, and you're at the unit then you go to the next level, this place, this low vis experience. Did that just, um, did you feel like that desire to do something more continued to build or you were always looking for that with your time in service? Did it continue as you got out? And I, I don't know if TBI contributes to that or if it made it harder for you to step away. I guess I'm wondering the, the mentality as you talk about not giving yourself a chance to just enjoy being successful at some point. How did it weigh on you over time? <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, I never thought about it. Um, my wife had to point it out to me many, many years later, but you know, our upbringing, you know, which you and I discussed in our preparation for this, you know, I told you the story about, you know, I, I didn't check the mail on my way home from school yeah. one day. And, you know, my father asked me about it and I said, yeah, I didn't check it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. You know, how about I get it tomorrow? And he's like, how about you get it now? And I'm like, well, you know, it's a quarter mile away and it's dark and it's a walk, you know, past the woods. And he's like, whoa, 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 what? I was like, yeah, it's, it's dark. It's night. And he's like, so you're, you're scared to go walk in the dark to check the mail. And I'm like, man, it's like, cause you're going now. 
right? And so, you know, and he was doing me a solid, absolutely. And, you know, the poor guy must be exhausted because there were plenty of times he had to do that when I was growing <laughs> up. He like, okay, <laughs> go. He just wasn't going to let me give in to myself. And so, you know, I, I what ended up happening then was that there were just um, – there was just one challenge after another that I think I just, after, after a while, it, it just, anytime I found myself frightened by something or, or uncomfortable with something, my upbringing required that I deal with it. And I didn't really know anything else. I wasn't a particularly academically gifted person. In fact, you literally couldn't pay me to care when I was younger, but that series challenges or not being good at math or not understanding physics or anything was just always this thing where you're like, okay, well, great, because that's what you're going to do now. And so I could be great at English and I was, but if I had a physics class in high school and I stunk and I stunk at it, well, then get this done. Now you're going to pay attention to this. Like you don't have the option to not good at, be good at it when it's part of your response, my responsibility to, to attend to. And so I just eventually Every single time I identified some sort of a shortcoming in myself, I was like, well, man, I'm going to have to, now I got to deal with it. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. Um, and that just crossed over into the service so much so that once I got to the military, it was, that's all it is. That's all it is. Yeah. What's next, right? What's the next? Yeah. Best and thing. particularly in the middle of a long war, right? That's all that it is. It's just dealing with the next challenge. You don't get an op. You do have the option, of course. You've got the option. I had the option to not do that stuff. But just like having parents who were like, okay, well, you're going to walk in the dark and check the mail because nothing's going to happen to you. And if it does, I'm, I'm there to help you. You know, in the unit, it's like, well, here you are with all these great people. None of these, you know, and they're all, most of them are rangers. There's like, let's go, come on, move the breach and deal with the uncertain thing. It just became normal after a while. So that when I finally got my degree, well, I had a bachelor's degree, but I didn't have a master's degree. And I didn't believe that I could get a master's degree. I didn't believe I was a person who could process peer reviewed journal articles and turn them into a 20 page paper. So the very fact that I thought that I was like, off to graduate school, you go. <laughs> because I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> that though, once I did that was, that was the point at which I had, cause I was still working. I was still operating. And I found then that once I threw that on top, that was the point at which I realized something was wrong. Did you realize it or did Jennifer? I didn't realize it. I knew that it was something was wrong and I thought it was my fault. So for, well, I knew it was my fault. Uh, you know, there's no, there's nothing, there's no, I had no other way to understand it. But the, the, the great thing about where I was at that time was that in order to stay in that low vis program, you have to go get your head shrunk every six to nine months. So they got to check and make sure whether or not you're still good to go or you've gone high and right. And so, you know, we, I got to talk with the psych. Well, I didn't get to, I mean, I had to, right. I got to talk with the psych every six to nine months. And so he's tracking everything. And it was him who said, you know, we haven't, you know, and this was kind of an emerging thing, understanding TBI. And he said, you know, we're looking, I'm looking at your records here. I'm hearing what you're telling me. And, um, you know, I, I think maybe the National Trevor Center of Excellence is a good option. It's, it's a natural, this is, this is a normal, natural thing. He had to talk me into that. But it was because of being in the low visibility program and in order to stay in it, of the many things you had to do to stay in it, one of them was go to the psych every six to nine months. He was the one who said, cool, you're going to NICO. Wow. And if we had Jennifer here, for instance, and, and we asked her, when did she start noticing you maybe acting differently from because she had known you for so long i would assume she could see this change happening over time how would she describe from her perspective you think i think that she would um she would tell you that there were a lot of nightmares at that point in time a lot a lot of nightmares very specific nightmares so waking up you know yeah. screaming um a lot of night sweats, like uh, just totally, just yeah, just night intense night sweats, and and nightmares, and um, 
angry. I was very, very angry. I was a very angry person. Um, it was just constant smoldering anger. And then, um, I, I don't think Jennifer would say this, but I'll say it. I was drinking pretty regularly, pretty regularly. I had a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Yeah. Wow. So a lot of those factors that, that, that you hear about from time to time, and these are, this is TBI related. This is not, and you got to correct me here, Derek. This is not PTSD. This is TBI. Yeah, I've spent it was a lot a lot of my time outside of active duty trying to understand this. NICO was the start, and they say that right, like this is the beginning of your journey. Um, the first thing was explaining sleep to me, and the neurologist goes, "How do you how do you feel about a CPAP?" And I said to him very clearly, I leaned in, I said, "Doc, listen to me. I am a very very vain man." And there's no version of this where I'm crawling into bed next to a woman who has promised the rest of her life to me wearing a fighter pilot's mask and six feet of hose. It's just not happening. And he looked at me and he's like, okay, all right, so smooth, so smooth. Like I'm sure, like I thought, this guy's so smooth. He must have gone through the training that you've gone through. Yeah. He's like, okay, no problem. And kind of handles the whole thing. He goes, well, you've got your sleep study and let's just, we'll see, you know, see what the results are and then we'll figure something out together. I was like, oh, I think I just got handled. And so I, I had my sleep study and, um, you know, and then he reviewed the results with me. And that was when he showed me, you know, I'd go from phase one to phase two and then come out of phase two. As soon as I hit phase three, bounce out and then start again and bounce out and start again and bounce out and start again and bounce out. And so I was bouncing out of, out of the sleep cycle 15 times an hour, which qualifies as high, mild to low, moderate sleep apnea. But he said, you've got two things going on, right? You're a middle-aged guy and you've got some obstructive sleep apnea going on. He said, but you're doing something interesting, which is that you've got central nervous system related apnea. So like if you and I were on a cross-country flight together and I would fall asleep on the plane, which I dread, I'm... I used to, like, I used to feel just this kind of, and I never said this to anybody. I can't believe I'm saying this on the World Wide Web. I just, like, panic, like, just feel this kind of, like, amped up panic and not understanding it, right? And just being like, oh, we're not talking about this. I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out, going to, right? We're just not going to talk about the fact that for some reason I feel <laughs> super, super angsty. Well, now I understand what it is because it's, what happens is that I fall asleep, I stop breathing, that CO2 level builds up. And it's my body automatically going, you know, and so, and it's because it's an emergency, right? It's a physical, it's how they check, you know, people when they're brain dead in part is, you know, hold their nose and their mouth and wait for the CO2 level to, or the hold the nose and wait for the CO2 level to build up. And then the body just automatically makes them inhale. Well, that's me 15 times an hour, every hour, all night. So by the time, by the time they put a sleep study you know, put me through a sleep study, I probably hadn't slept properly in nine, nine or 10 years, man. And so when he showed me the graph, he said, so, hey, I, I understand how you feel about the CPAP. Uh, but what do you, what, you know, when we talk, how do you feel about it now? And when I saw the show a ranger a picture, Ryan, right? <laughs> and as soon as I saw the pictures, I was like, oh man, he goes, look, let's do this. Well, you know, try it for a couple days, try it for the time we're here, see how you feel. And um, I, I went ahead and tried it, and I will submit to you and anybody listening that there is probably not a placebo effect when you're tied into something attached to your face with six feet of hose to it, because I had two or three nights of uninterrupted sleep, and I had not felt that good for as long as I could wow. remember. And as soon as, as soon as I just started sleeping properly – then that all a lot of that amperage came down. It still wasn't totally gone because then what would happen is that years later I would be I would really be blessed to be introduced to Dr. Gene Lipoff, who conducted stellate ganglia block, and that you know helped my sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic ner nervous system do their thing and settled that all down. It took me to a pre fight or flight state, and between that and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and peptide therapy and nutri nutraceutical supplementation, that stack, that health and wellness stack for me 
brought me then to a, a healthy and peaceful place. But it took a solid five or six years to put all that together. What? Yeah. Is man. that sorry? So just real quick, Derek, for people who are who are, are thinking they might have this and they ha they're getting treatment for it, is the five or six years common? Because it just takes that long to implement, or is it you were learning about the issues that you had and they were trying to treat them sequentially? Man, a lot of the learning was on me and I was, you know, wow. you'll hear me say it a lot. It was, I, it was a blessing, right? It was a blessing. I didn't want to be Jennifer's alcoholic husband, right? So I had to figure out why was I drinking? That was a lot. There was a lot of work. Nobody's going to quit drinking until they understand why they do it. If you're not willing to do that, then you're going to struggle to figure out what it takes to stop. It would took a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work to figure that out. A lot of work to figure that out. And it is an ugly process to get there. Um, and so there was that. And then I found out about testosterone and that issue after my after my good friend Greg Leach killed himself. And I was in a pretty dark place. And, and you know, I was trying to figure my stuff out. And I serendipitously came across an article in Sniper Magazine in 2018. It was the last article written by Tom Beckstrand that talked about BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. I wouldn't have known about that. I wouldn't have met Dr. Greg Brandon, who's my doc. You know, I'm probably the only guy you know who has a gynecologist, right? Because Dr. Brandon's a gynecologist and he, he went and started, I'm a guy with an OBGYN internet. There you go. Yeah. Uh, he went and started a hormone clinic. Um, it was called the Youth Institute then. It's Optimal Bio now. And, and, and Greg, Greg has been just wonderful. And, and he really was my first sort of, he was my first wellness coach outside of NICO. He was my first wellness coach. Wow. And he helped me with all of those things. And then I met Gene Lipoff and I met, you know, a number of other people. But to answer your question, here's the thing. I, there, I think there are a couple of things at least that people struggle with from my, from my experience. One is a willingness to understand the source of the problems because these are really hard conscience, guilty conscience riddled suck fest type things to work through. And so, and we don't talk a lot about that stuff. DJ Shipley did a really great job on his piece with Sean Ryan talking about how guys could sit around the table like they don't talk about this stuff, but they're all going through the same thing. Guys are talking about it now. So understanding the source of it. Two is putting in the work because you cannot medicate your way through any of these things. You can get on a CPAP machine, but you still have to put the effort into sleeping properly. I can get, you know, BHRT and get my you know, 35 year old body back, which, you know, looks ridiculous with a 51 year old face, but it's not, the hormones are not going to do that themselves. You still have to go to the gym. You still have to eat right, you know, in order for the nutraceuticals to work and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you can't medicate your way out of any of this stuff. And then even when he, when somebody sources it properly and understands where it's coming from, when they get the treatments or when they start to think about the treatments, it really before that, and this is the biggest, biggest challenge. It's organizing the market. It's a, and Jen, Jen and Tom Satterley do a nice job. Jen Satterley talks about this in Arsenal of Hope, that there was a bunch of stuff they had to do that, you know, Tom Satterley figure out. I don't want to speak for them since so it's just out of the book. It's iterating through all of the things. And you've got to pay for that yourself. Yeah. you got to pay for all of it. That's the challenge. Understand where it's coming from, organize the market. And then once you find the medication, the, med the health and wellness options, that are good for you, then you've got to do the work. And you, you became a life and wellness coach, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of help yeah. other people do this. Yeah. 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 I did. I did. Jeez. I was counseling vets pro bono for a while. I think I just recently put, I just recently came out of that just because I have some projects that I needed to get done that weren't getting done. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't want to, I had guys were calling cause I was pretty open about my story and then it was, they were calling often enough that I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to give anybody bad dope, right? Data on previous yeah. engagements. And so I just figured out how to coach properly and went from there. So one of the things that you had mentioned was, and I'll need you to expand on this just so people know, but you were successful in the private sector, but at yeah. the same time. Not to put words in your mouth, so you, you use the right ones, but you did not love it, right? Right. You, you, you missed the mission. So many, so many vets can relate to that, myself included. 
Okay. Can you talk about what that was like for you and, and how, if at all, TBI influenced the, the, those feelings? Yep. So when I retired, I was really, really fortunate to have gotten, you know, been offered employment, you know, from, um, I'm thinking of three in, three executives in particular, um, and they were really great about offering me really, really, really good positions. And, um, and I, and, uh, and I was, I was, I was blessed to be able to work in those companies. <clears throat> and that included a company where I was, you know, this man, the CEO trusted me with, you know, helping him get his company ready for sale and, you know, working for him as his chief strategy officer. And, you know, I got a chance to write a company's, you know, inaugural corporate strategy. And I got to, you know, be a member of a medium sized enterprise C suite, you know, 55 people in it. And the people I worked with were very, they were really great to work with. They were really gracious with me. They were good teammates. And um, that all of that was a great experience. We sold that when that company sold. um, That is, that is, um, that is um, an experience that is, that is memorable. It's got a certain intensity to it that goes beyond um, that is outside of the scope of what I was interested in. You hear me trying to be polite here, right? It was really pretty unpleasant. Um, and it's, that's the deal, right? That's the deal. You want to get your, we just, you know, kind of call it getting your business guy ranger tab. So, I mean, I mean I'm a post-exit, medium enterprise, yeah. C-suite guy. I've got my business guy ranger tab. And I was really fortunate to do it. Um but I didn't dig that. It didn't help that I was away from Jennifer because we couldn't move. So I had to move to the Tampa Bay area to do it. And I saw Jennifer five times that year and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't great. So um, that was done. And, and the other thing too, was that everything I was doing was a lot of government contract work. And so by then I should not really have been doing that stuff anymore. So once we sold that company and I moved into the next position, after that, I did that. We did. I did a project that we closed down, and then I transitioned into my last job that required a clearance. And it was at that point that I realized I needed to stop doing this for a living. Why? Um, it was a lot of. Um, there was just a rigor administratively. There was a rigor in Garrison that that um, I think was just. Um, it was probably, it was time. I'd seen that movie before a number of yeah. times and I didn't have any, I didn't have a lot of patience for that anymore. Not there, not them. That's like, I mean, it just, I didn't, I needed to not be in that environment anymore. Um, that was, you know, that would have, that would be handled best by people who were fresh to it. Right. Had it been 10 years sooner, I would have had the gas in my tank for that. And at, that, at this point I just didn't. Um, where does, where does music core come in, in your post service life? And, and what is it? Let's establish what it is, but also the Berkeley route music core. Yeah. Music core is the best job I've had ever outside of the Delta force, man. It was, um, so I, I was asked to do something operationally that, you know, I've got a pretty strong stomach for risk. Um, this was, this was kind of, this, this was, uh, going to invite problems to follow follow me back and i i just wasn't i wasn't interested in imposing that level of risk on my home and it had to be it was so and then i ran it past a buddy of mine i said hey man i'm i need you to be your candid self i'm feeling this way about a thing this is what it is and i really want to pass on it because of this these reasons and it was it was just a piece of contract work that was, it was, um, you know, it, it would have been, it would have been, um, you know, sort of storybook intense like any of it was. And I was like, this just doesn't seem right, but I don't know, man. And he goes, he said to me, cause he comes from an undercover capability, undercover background. So he's no slouch. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, my buddies and I have a phrase for what you just described to me. He said, uh, we'd say the idiot light just went off on the dashboard of your life. <laughs> he said, so you probably should. He's like, you're right to not take this one. And I went back and I was like, well, damn, what am I going to do now? 
And I was, I, I did what I always do. I go to work out and I plug myself into this. I mean, I think I have enough music on here to go to the moon and back and not hear the same song. <laughs> and I was just had this moment of, of, you know, divinely inspired clarity where I thought, you know, I've smoked cigarettes, I've drank booze, I've, you know, I've done all kinds of things to self-medicate. But, you know, the thing that I've been self-medicating on for all the way back from the day I brought home the Still Life album was music. And the year that I was gone from home, you'll like this, I think. So I'm sitting, I had an apartment, <clears throat> right? And so I'm sitting here by myself and Jacob was going to come see me. And I was going to take him, you know, take him on a fishing charter and on a helicopter ride and do all this cool, cool stuff for his birthday. Yeah, yeah, helicopters. Nice. And I'm sitting there in my apartment in St. Petersburg and I'm looking at it and I was like, man, this place is a mess. But I'm looking at the floor and I was like, oh my God, this floor is so gross. I was like, I don't have a vacuum cleaner. So I go to, I call my wife, right? Because we'd had our, our, our stuff got swooped you know, sucked up in that whole OMB hack, my SF-86 oh, and all yeah. that. And our, our credit cards had been, you know, scanned and identity stuff and all that kind of stuff. And so we had alerts set on a credit card. So I called Jennifer and I said, hey, I, Jake's coming. Uh, you you would embar be embarrassed to me if you saw the state of this apartment. I got to go get a vacuum cleaner. And just let her know because then she would get the alert on the credit card because we were in you know, the identity thing. And she said, okay, cool. She said, just so you know, the only vacuum cleaner you're allowed to buy is a Dyson. So that way, when this is done, you know, we'll have a second Dyson for the house when, when you come back. I said, Roger that. And so I drive up 19 here in the Tampa Bay area to Best Buy because that's the only place that this dumbass ranger knows to get a Dyson. And I drive up to Best Buy to uh, get this vacuum cleaner before my son comes. And I park my car, and there just happens to be a guitar center right next to Best Buy. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, I've got nothing going on. And, you know, so whatever. I'll just go in and see because I haven't played guitar in years at this point. Um, I played guitar when I was younger. I played it a lot. You know, I performed and wrote and all that kind of stuff. And I'd recorded a demo and had a copy written and everything. And here I am with, you know, just by myself. And so I'm like, oh, there's a guitar center. Let's see what's going on in the guitar world. And I go in and I check that kind of stuff out. Do my thing. I get in the car and I drive, you know, I drive back to my apartment from Best Buy. There's no vacuum cleaner in my car, but there is a brand new Fender Stratocaster and a Marshall combo amp. <laughs> and so it was then that I'm trying to, I'm spending my time in the apartment by myself, just finishing up my MBA and playing music and, and, you know, just waiting for the chance to see my wife again. And, and, um, and so I, I returned to guitar that way. Then I went to go get a vacuum cleaner, but I was like, okay, I'm not going to go to that Best Buy because I don't trust myself to not go into the Guitar Center and do it. So I went to the other Best Buy on the other side of the Tampa Bay area, and I went to get a vacuum cleaner. And when I drove home from that um, errand, there was, again, no vacuum cleaner, but a Fender Telecaster. And that's the point at which I started collecting these things. And Jennifer had to Amazon a vacuum cleaner to me because I kept buying guitars. Uh, so, um, awesome. and then ultimately what happened was that I realized that, um, I did not know what I was doing anymore. And so when I had my sort of epiphany about needing to get out of the business, the dot gov business, um, I had this thing about, I just don't understand this instrument. And then I didn't understand what I was experiencing mentally. I just thought it was my ignorance. And so I was like, well, I wonder if I could get into music school. Right? Like, is that really the craziest thing I've ever done? You know? So I, 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 I looked and I was like, well, I mean, I, if I could go anywhere, I'd go to Berkeley. You know? Susan Tedeschi went to Berkeley. Big Wreck. You know, Big Wreck. I love that band. They all met at Berkeley. You know, all these great musicians. Like, oh, I'd go to Berkeley. And so I, I, I looked into it and I was like, man, okay. So I decided to apply. And then for my audition piece, I sent an original composition and they let me in, man. Wow. Yeah, they let me in. Of all the schools yeah. to have this battle hardened Delta guy go to, Berkeley, just, I don't know if, you know, if, if your father's still alive or not, Derek, did he, did he pass away or is he still alive? No, he's still, he's still alive. Yeah. And to be clear, it's the Berkeley College of Music. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was going to Berkeley. Yeah, the so, Berkeley College of Music in Boston. 
So you go, how long is that? And how challenging is it? I mean, you've been to every school. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. No, no way. It's really? the hardest thing. I, yeah, Why? it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Why? Yeah. Um, you know, I wrote a piece for the War Horse that's going to get published here. And I think it's this month because I had to do an exercise for, for a class, for a chords class. Um, the Berkeley guitar department is steeped in jazz. And, and these are, you know, seventh chords and inversions and arpeggios. And you've got to know the fretboard and you've got to know how to read music. Or you eventually got to know how to read music. These, these men and women in the guitar department are virtuoso players. They are amazing guitar players. And they're really gracious and kind people. They've been really gracious and kind to me. But but uh, we're not talking about three chords and the truth, man. I mean, this is like the nitty gritty knowing. You know, one of the one of the professors described it best. He's like, "Why do we do this? Why do we learn this? And why are we doing this?" And we're all like, "Well, I don't know. You're going to answer this question, so we're just going to wait for that." And he said, "We're trying to get freedom." He goes, "We are trying to find freedom here." We are trying to find creative freedom here. And I was like, that's the most brilliant, inspirational thing I think I've ever heard. Ever since my first team leader at the unit said to me, you're never going to beat me to the door, but you better try. That guy said, we're, we're doing this because we're trying to find creative freedom on the fretboard. I was like, oh, I'm in, man. But of course, once I, once I got into it, it's re sight reading and it's, understanding what notes you're playing with these, you know, fix these, you know, four, four note chords and five, just, it's so complicated. Wow. But rewarding. I have to imagine rewarding and you're just in it all day long. I, I wasn't in it all day long cause I was still working. Um, uh, but I would, I had to get to the point where I would get, I'm to the point now where I have to do it all day. And, um, or most of the day I've just come off a run of finishing finals and it was, I've, I was doing harmony, you know, getting inside harmony because it was every day, all day. Then, you know, my final exam for my private lesson with Scott Teruli, who's the best. And that's just days of figuring stuff out. If, if you don't play these things every day, it really shows, man. Wow. So where every does day. the music core come in? So when I was applying to, um, getting ready to apply to Berkeley, I was trying to figure out how I was going to pay for it. And so truth in lending, forget the pun, is that I'm getting it through voc rehab, vocational rehabilitation, and through the VA. And um, because I said to them, I just, you know, I, I want to try and keep things lighthearted. But the, the thing is that by the time I got to the point where I couldn't, hand, I just couldn't, st I could handle it. I just didn't want to do government work anymore. Like I absolutely broke down just emotionally i emotionally frapped in man it i had been doing it for so long i had never actually transitioned out of doing the work i just retired from the army and then just went and did it in the private sector it never ended and when i needed to stop i absolutely frapped in and so um, when I talk to the voc rehab people, because I shouldn't get it, right? I mean, I've got a degree, I've got, you know, an MBA and all that kind of stuff. They're like, why would we do this? And I said, well, I'd, you know, do it or don't do it, but I can't do this for a living anymore. They're like, well, what do you want to do? Well, I've been talking to veterans enough and trying to help them organize the market for themselves that I knew I wanted to help, you know, guy, my guys and, you know, and, and guys and gals, you know, who felt the way I was feeling. And so... I realized that if I was going to do it over an extended period of time, I really wanted to become a music therapist. And you can't become a music therapist without a music therapy degree or a music degree. And in the process of all of that, trying to find my way through all of that, I called a very nice lady and uh, named Heather Bernard, who introduced me to, among other people, Arthur Bloom. Have you ever met Arthur Bloom from Music Court? No, I've never met him. And she introduced me to Arthur Bloom. And I, I was welcomed into the music core tribe by this wonderful, wonderful person. I mean, almost immediately. And, and uh, he's like, come be, be a part of the program. You know, this is what we do. Um, we do music rehabilitation for injured veterans. And, um, 
we can assign you a teaching artist. We have great teaching artists here. We'll teach you how to play guitar. Love that you're going to Berkeley. Do it. We'll be here to help you through that and 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 help you learn your instrument. And um, and um, and that's how I that's how I met him. And I participated in the program as a student for about a year, year and a half before I just said to him, "Hey, I want to join your team. Like, please, uh, what can I do? I'll do. What do you need done? I'll do it." But I just would love to be a member of this team, and that was when I became Man. an employee. Who who would you recommend look at something like Music Core? Oh yeah, any injured veteran who an injured veteran um, who has an interest in music and thinks I can't get an instrument, I can't get instruction, I can't do this. Um, you get on the website or. Um, you know, contact us. Um, if you're an injured veteran who wants to learn an instrument, we are here for you. That's awesome. Okay. So we'll have ways for people to find you and I'm going to get you out of here in just a minute, Derek, because I know I've kept you long enough. Got two questions I ask everybody, but there's one in particular I just wanted to ask you for those who can't see you, lots of tattoos on the arms. Yeah. If, are those more military or music? Is it like rock and roll based or is that uh, from your time in service? So I didn't get tattoos until I retired. And um, I, it was actually my first, my first foray into art and my first tattoo artist. And I was in St. Petersburg, you know, working, you know, by myself and we had done the acquisition and, and all of that. And I was, you know, I was the Mont Blanc pen guy and the Toomey briefcase guy and the fancy suit guy and the Allen Edmond, you know, shoes and all of that. And all of that, you know, was like no bueno in the end. And so I, I was like, man, I'm done behaving myself. I'm going to get tattooed. And I went and met Ben Millman, who was my first tattoo artist. So I, two tattoo artists, Ben Millman and Stephanie Zarzecki uh, were the two artists I got to. But that was when I first experienced art. And then Ben Millman is also a guitar player. And so I was able to get into that community and they're really great. And so the answer to your question, this is, this is a military tattoo for sure. Um, but this is, this is Jennifer and the ch Jennifer and the children. And then on our 20th wedding anniversary, because when I was really trying to figure myself out and get out of that sort of hole I was in, the hand that reached down and pulled me, relentlessly to help me get out and get back on my feet was my wife. And so on our 20th anniversary, she's always been my true North. And so, you know, I put that on, on, on this that's hand. Cool. And so that's really cool. Jeez. So the, the two questions I like to ask everybody, one is when you were in the service and you were downrange, was there anything that you wanted to have with you either on your person or somewhere nearby that had sentimental value, something that somebody had given you a good luck charm, something like that. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, when Jacob was small, he had two things that he carried around. You know, your, your kids had a thing, you know, they had their sort of special thing. And Jake always carried his, he had bear right from bear in the big blue house. He had his bear toy, but the thing he wouldn't go anywhere with. And if it ended up in the dryer, the washing machine in the dryer, he'd stand there and howl until it came out was was big big blanket and big big blanket had these triangles around it on the outside and he'd lie in bed and he'd he'd just play with his triangles until he fell asleep it was a tiny it was just a tiny little thing at the time and um jennifer um when i first deployed my son um, my son was uh tiny and so uh and i missed him badly so what jennifer did was she cut off one of the triangles to big big blanket and I carried that with me everywhere I went. Where did you have it in a pocket, like in the vest? Where'd you put it? Yeah, yeah. It was I kept it in a Ziploc bag and and it was always, you awesome. know, you know, here. And I was always checking for it like it was a sensitive item. Yeah. We've got to have it. Got the rifle. Where's the, the triangle? All right. And the last question I ask everybody, just looking back at the time, I'm sure you lost people that you cared about and the, and the sacrifice that goes on with Jennifer and the kids. Uh, would you go back and do that again? Do what again? The the years of service that you put in, the time that you were away. If if you were looking at your 20-year-old self, you're like, hey, get ready to go on this ride. 
but it's going to be worth it. Like, would you go back and kind of go through that again, even knowing would, what you had, what you had yeah. to go through? I would absolutely do it again. I would absolutely do it again. The only change I would make is that when I was in Garrison, instead of staying at the compound and, and banging steel until 7 p.m., is that when I was home, I would make sure that I'm home for dinner every single night that I'm not deployed. That's the only change I would make. I love that. That's a great one. And I should have asked. So you mentioned Rolling Stones was where you started. Mm. What's what's the go-to now? Like if you're just, if you need to get into the zone and you just want to listen to good music, where do you go now? What's the the group? Well, there's no single group. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them, but I would point, I would point folks to Beth Hart. Beth Hart is awesome. If you want to see an amazing vocalist, watch her do Broken and Ugly, the recording of Broken and Ugly at Paradiso. And then, you know, her recording of Leave the Light On at the Royal Albert Hall. And then the other one that comes to mind is Joe Bonamassa. Um, look at his, I think it's his 09 performance of Just Got Paid and Mountain Time also at the Royal Albert Hall. And then I like, you know, Alter Bridge, love them. They got a new album coming out. Can't wait. Um, who else? I, I, I would, uh, the, the list is, the list is, is significant, but I would say, uh, right off the bat, Beth Hart and Joe, Joe. Awesome. Right. Thanks so much, Derek, for the time, Thank Just you for being very open about these issues that a lot of people I know are going through. And to your point, probably don't talk about as much as they should. And I think hearing somebody like you who's been through what you've been through talking about it, um, gives people the space to open up. So it's great to hear. Thank you. And thanks for this. This is a wonderful podcast you do. So thanks so much for what you do, man. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. We've got a lot more content, um, including my thoughts after I wrap up an episode, some additional photos that don't ever make it into the into the video or on social media from, from the guests, and, and sometimes maybe an additional bio sheet or some of the questions that I have prepared that we put up on our Patreon page if you're interested in getting a little bit more. And you can find that on patreon.com slash combat story. Now let's dive into some listener comments. First one comes from a pretty long name, DJ134, and then some additional digits there, but it's an Apple five-star review. It says, uh, need a list. I love this podcast. Look forward to hearing what's next every week. Wish there was a way for me to see a list of books from all of your guests. Sometimes the one and two part interviews just aren't enough. And then I thought this was pretty cool. 10th Mountain, 2BCT, 431 Infantry, Delta Co, um, OIF 2009. So first of all, thank you to whoever left that DJ. Um, Appreciate the five star review, but also the suggestion on the book list. I have put one together, I haven't released it yet, and I need to do that. I'm gonna shoot for that after we hit our 100th episode. So um, I've gotten some requests for it in the past, you are certainly not the first, and there are a lot of them. It's, I I don't want to do lip service to it either. You know, I wanna make sure that there is some context for each book, what it meant to me as I read it, why I would recommend it to someone else. And as many of you know, Um, The podcast is my passion project, but I've also got a day job. So I do try to fit that in. um, And I'm going to try to get you more of that after we hit our 100th episode. So thank you for doing that. And thanks for leaving that review. Um, It means a lot because it gets the message out and helps us rank higher uh, for people on Apple, which is not just good for me. It's really to get these stories out, which is why we do this. So thank you. Second comment uh, is a YouTube comment on the Kristen Murdoch interview. This interview did better than I expected, actually. I'm really happy to see it, so thank you to all who listened to it. This comment is from Hector Sandoval. It says, thank you for your service, Kristen and Ryan. What an amazing woman. She's so down to earth, but what an alpha. It's great to hear what happens um, that we never really get to hear, but put um, an amazing face and tiny glimpse um, into the life of such a beautiful person that it helps guide our elite forces into battle. And for those who haven't heard that interview, Kristen was the S2 or the Intel rep for SEAL Team 6 or Dev Crew. So certainly not a position that's handed out lightly and obviously not one that you would imagine a, a woman being in that role, which is part of the reason we wanted to share this. And she's not the only one who's been there. 
So pretty cool background. Um, interesting take from the Intel perspective, the military Intel side of the house, slightly different from the world that I lived in, but also a very tight turnaround targeting cycle that, that you would imagine in a place like DevGrew. So different perspective from the more strategic work that I had done at the agency. So Hector, thank you for sharing that. Our last comment is a YouTube comment on the Dutch Moyer interview, and it's from Destro. It says, Ryan is providing a free education and character building with this channel. Thank you to all the men and women who have and continue to serve. And a big shout out to you, Ryan, for providing a genuine platform for these conversations. And obviously, there are a ton of comments that come in each week, and I can't thank you all enough for doing it. I chose this one because of this comment about providing free education and character building. And I never intended that to be something that we had with this channel when I started. But I definitely agree that that's one of the outcomes. Um, an unintended but positive outcome is the character building you get from this. The experiences and how people weathered really difficult times in those moments of service that we can all apply to what we're doing today. I do it regularly. There are times where I'm running, um, you know, just trying to get my workout in. And I'll think back to some of these interviews I've done of people who push through and the mentality that they had or some of the really specific tactics they used to push through tough times. And I'll think to those to help keep me going, even in, in, in my life where I'm just trying to work out so I can uh, fly a desk, as I like to say, since I'm no longer in uniform. But thank you for leaving that comment, Destro. It's a great one. And, and thanks for the support, obviously, for me and the channel. Couldn't do it without you and the other listeners. So thank you all for tuning in each week. And we are coming up on 100 episodes. So um, I'm pretty excited to share that our 100th episode is going to be with none other than John Shrek McPhee in person. Uh, we're scheduled to go out there and meet him. So I am so excited of what's to come there. Thank you all. You all stay safe.